So yeah, first of all, nice, nice to meet all of you and thank you for coming. Yeah, my name is Nicola and I'm a student of computer science at the uh, University of London and also a member of Google Club at University of London. Today, I would like to talk about physics for computer graphics and VR. Besides that, important thing to say at the beginning is that you can see my email, right? So you can contact me there if you need any help or any questions related to physics or computer graphics or VR or maybe uh, something about the workshop and uh, some kind of homework that I will give you later at the end of today's event. Yeah, maybe I should also say at the beginning, like uh, the way I imagined this event to happen is that it will have two parts. So the first part will be the webinar and uh, then we will have a short break, maybe five minutes. And after that, we will have uh, the workshop where we will kind of practice and see in practice those things that we covered in the first part in the webinar. Also important thing to say at the beginning is that this will be like a light, gentle introduction to physics. So nothing too advanced, so high school level of physics. And also when it comes to math, that is the background for, for this physics, it won't require any advanced uh, mathematical apparatus. Yeah, high school math, it's it's enough. That's all you need to understand today's topics. The reason why I would like to talk about physics for computer graphics and VR is because usually people are intimidated by physics and they think that if they skip something that they can never catch up. And in certain cases, that, yeah, that can be true. It can be very difficult to catch up because it's difficult to fill in those gaps. But uh, when it comes to computer graphics and virtual reality, the thing is that you don't need too much physics. So you need, in general, you need just classical mechanics. And that's the first topic that people study when it comes to physics. And the reason why people study that topic first is because it was also the first topic that people discovered when they learned about the world around them. So those are like uh, the laws of nature that were first discovered and proved by people. Yeah, you don't need all the topics. So the topics that you need in computer graphics and VR are only the topics that you can obviously see with your own eyes. That's a good thing because uh, if you can see it, you can um, understand it easily. So it's nothing too abstract, uh, nothing too complicated to understand. So all those things come intuitively and something that all of us understand based on our intuition. So just we maybe we don't know how to quantify that and how to define that in terms of mathematics. And mathematics is like the language of nature and we just uh, use mathematics to formalize those laws of physics and the laws of nature. So we will try to do that a little bit today. And some things that we are going to cover today will have only like rough definitions. So it, they won't be strict and they won't dive into details. So we can say that they are not 100% correct, but for uh, our purposes, they are correct enough. They are, let's say, 100% correct for our purposes. I think that's it for the beginning. That's all that you should know and how things are going to work today. So without further ado, let's just dive into the topic. So, yeah, first things that we need to answer is what is physics and like history and applications of physics. So yeah, here you can see some small picture and in that picture, you can see all kinds of topics and equations that you can see in physics. So we won't cover all of those. We will focus uh, only on certain parts, but first in general, let's uh, answer what is physics. Yeah, we can say that physics is like natural science. It describes laws of nature. It tries to describe nature and to explain everything that's happening around us. We said that physics, some people say that uh, physics is mother of all sciences. Some people say that it is mathematics, but it is difficult to say because they come together. When people discovered some new phenomena and try to describe some new phenomena in physics and in nature, they realized that their, their mathematical apparatus was not sophisticated enough and that's how they discovered new things in mathematics. So kind of physics and the math, they uh, come together and uh, through the history, they always pushed each other to go further. That is why it is difficult to say which one is mother of all sciences. So yeah, we can say that both of them are together. As I said, so physics tries to, to describe, to define uh, all things around us. And first of all, what is that what is around us. So we call it matter. Matter is something that exists 
without our attentions exists regardless whether we are paying attention to it or whether we are aware of that. So it just exists. And we can say that matter has like two shapes or forms. One is like substance and the other is like field, like physical field. Matter is kind of like those physical things that you can feel, that you can touch, that you can kind of experience with your senses. So field is like that kind of, let's call it like space that surrounds matter. So it can be like a gravitation or electromagnetical field. So there are different kinds of fields. Field is a little bit difficult to experience with your senses, except maybe for gravity, because you can feel it every day. But still, we don't pay attention to it. And then we come to this thing, physics and other sciences. So we said, what is relationship between physics and math? But we can also hear like, what is relationship between physics and, uh, and chemistry? And we said that matter has like two shapes or forms, like substance and field. And we can say that chemistry is more focused on substance and physics is more focused on field. So, of course, this is a rough uh, statement. I mean, a rough definition, and it is not 100% correct, but for our purposes is completely okay. As things develop, so physics intertwined with all other sciences, both the natural and social sciences. Together, uh, today you came because physics has applications in computer graphics and VR and all other things, but those two primarily. Yeah, that's about relationship between physics and other sciences. The thing that I skipped to say, that I forgot to say, is that physics tries to kind of describe properties of matter and the structure of matter and also like changes that happen to matter. We can say that uh, those changes that happen to matter uh, is called motion. And we will see why motion is important later when we start working on mechanics and kinematics. And also it tries to define like the laws and the reasons why that motion and those changes happen. Okay, next important thing that we need to cover is experiment and theory. Both are essential for physics. They both have like certain place in physics. So let's start with theory. Theory is like collective knowledge about certain topic that we have and how they are intertwined and connected, all those certain informations about certain topic. But experiment, it's a like controlled environment that we have, that we set up in order to prove some hypothesis or some theory. And the good thing about experiment is that it is, as I said, it is controlled. And that's why we can repeat the experiment. We can change some things in our experiment until we are satisfied with correctness of our results, because it can happen that we notice that our results were kind of infected by some outside influence. Experiment gives us that like isolated experience where we can isolate and only focus on certain aspect on certain law and only study it because we want to define only that law. It's not affected by other things that are happening around. So that's why it is important to have that isolated experience in physics experiments. The next thing that we need to talk about are physical quantities and units. Everything around us, we said it's matter, right? And how can we, we describe matter? Well, we need to use some quantities or units that are used for those quantities. Here you will have on next slide, you will have all important units that you need to know. But yeah, I will let you take a look at it uh, a little bit later. Yeah, physical quantities. So we said that they describe matter and they quantify matter. We can say that there are seven basic quantities and there are uh, corresponding units to those seven quantities. So how, how do they come to those quantities? Basically, we took like what is like one second, what is one meter? So how did we decide like how much is one meter? How much is one second? Well, we try to think about quantity that is kind of related to human experience of life. So uh, one meter is something that is related to our body shape and something that we can measure with, with our bodies and something that we can experience easily. Okay. And yeah, so here you can see those units and those are seven that are basic fundamental quantities. What, what does it mean that they are fundamental? They are completely basic and all other units are all other quantities are made of these. So certain combination of these will give you hundreds, thousands of other quantities. Those are like mass. So symbol is 
small m and the uh, unit is kilogram and symbol is kg se unit so that's international system of units uh, that defines all quantities in physics and in natural sciences in case that you do certain experiments in the future and whatever you do related to science you will need to stick to those units so there are other systems of units but this is like international standard for science and other units that we have here are length, unit is a meter, we have time, unit is second, current, ampere is the unit, so temperature, it's Kelvin. Interesting thing for Kelvin to say is that it's different from Celsius and Fahrenheit, which is used in daily life, because Kelvin, zero Kelvin degrees, it's kind of absolute zero. That means that that matter has no energy and therefore has no temperature. So basically, physically, that's impossible because if it doesn't have temperature and it doesn't have energy that means that it doesn't exist and the reason why people don't use kelvin in daily life is because it's not something that is related to our experience like zero kelvin is like minus 273 degrees celsius and that's not the temperature that you can see in daily life so that's why we invented other scales like uh, celsius and, and uh, fahrenheit and the next one is amount of substance uh, the unit is mole and the last one is luminous intensity and unit is candela so the next thing that we need to study are vectors why do we need to study vectors sometimes those quantities physical quantities it's a little a little bit difficult to describe them with one unit with one number with uh, only with numerical value so sometimes we need something more than that numerical value and that's uh, where their vectors come um, besides that numerical value we have magnitude so which represents so yeah magnitude is actually a numerical value we also have the direction of a vector so it tells us also where that numerical value is uh, directed directed towards something that's what's called the direction of a vector so we can say that the vector has two main things those are magnitude the length the numerical value and also the direction it basically shows into what direction numerical value is kind of going or directed to so if you imagine a coordinate system like x and y axis it will have certain direction in that coordinate system and we have tail and head direction is obviously towards the head of the vector and then we will do some operations on the vectors but since this is about computer graphics and vr to mention vector and raster graphics so because maybe that's the question that will come to your mind probably most of you know because you're uh, already in the field uh, in computer science you know that raster graphics uses like pixels right and if you need to scale that picture if you need to zoom it zoom in or do anything with that picture it will become blurry and you will lose the quality but vector graphics it won't lose quality if it is zoomed in or if you do uh, something else to it because it scales accordingly it will keep that quality the thing that we need to talk about are operations and vectors so we need to know what we can do with vectors there are three basic operations that we need the first one is vector addition that means that we can get two different vectors and put them together and we will get a new vector that is like resulting vector so a completely new vector and the one way to do it is we have like vector a and we also have vector b we can put them together their tails and we can draw that parallelogram draw that diagonal line and we will get the resulting vector a plus plus b so that is one way to add vectors together and the other way to add vectors together is simply by putting tail of the second vector to the head of the first vector and we can do so on as many vectors as we have so in this case we have a b c and d so we can put them all together so head to tail head to tail head to tail and we will get the resulting vector x the next operation that is important to mention is vector subtraction like subtraction with numbers it's kind of the opposite from addition right what does that mean for vectors that means that direction will change so numerical value remains the same but the vector's direction will change we have like a minus b and that means that B will change its direction and we will get the opposite vector. Draw that minus B vector and put head to tail and we will get the resulting vector A minus B. The last operation that is important for us at the moment, we will cover other vector operations later in the series if you come to some of our future events. But for now, this is enough. We will do today scalar multiplication. So that means that we simply multiply vector by scalar numbers. So just multiply with numerical value. So what does that mean? That means that 
the direction of the vector remains the same, but the magnitude will increase. So if we had vector a and we multiplied by two by scalar, we will get a vector 2a that has two times bigger magnitude, but still has the same direction. And if we multiply it by scalar, that is minus three, for example, that means that it will have magnitude that is three times longer, but because of that minus, uh, as we saw in vector subtraction, it will change the direction. I forgot to say, I started talking about vectors, but I completely forgot to mention that there are like two types of units in physics, and uh, those are vectors and scalars. Some things like time, like mass, and those units that we saw in previous slides that we saw in fundamental quantities. So these are like scalars so they have like only numerical value but when we combine some of them we need to find another way to express these units then we will get some vector units some of these units some of these vector units we will see today so the next thing that we need to talk about is classical mechanics don't confuse it with quantum mechanics that is something kind of more advanced and that's not our interest so classical mechanics it basically covers the world around us and it's related to motion not only to motion also to statics so classical mechanics is kind of the first branch of physics that appeared and at that time it was not even a branch of physics that's what people thought that's all about physics that it is to know and that is all about nature that is to know but over time through the course of history people realized that's not it that's not the only thing and as they discovered more new classifications and new branches emerged Classical mechanics, it kind of covers three topics, three important topics, and those are kinematics, which we will cover today, dynamics and statics. So kinematics is a study of motion. It studies motion, so how things move, but it doesn't care about the cause of that motion. So it doesn't care what caused that motion, why it is happening, that is not important for kinematics. So kinematics is just trying to describe that motion with certain theories, with certain formulas, and just to, trying to describe it in details. Okay, and dynamics is the study of motion. It also cares about the cause of that motion. So, and what can the cause for motion be? Cause for motion can be force. So when we apply some force to an object that it doesn't move, then it will probably move, right? Dynamics actually gets into those reasons of motion. So it's a little bit more concerned with that part. Probably you studied Newton's laws in high school. Uh, that's That will be one of our future events. And the last one is statics. It's, as, as it says, it's study of equilibrium So and its relation to forces. So it kind of studies the balance between forces. And because of that balance, as the name suggests, objects are static. They are not moving. So because those forces probably are applied in opposite directions, so the body doesn't move. So it remains in the same place. So today we are going to study kinematics. As I said, kinematics is like the first branch of mechanics and it studies motion. When you think about the motion, Motion is really chaotic. We need a way to describe motion. So we need to kind of define certain types of motion so that we can separate it into those basic motions and then they combined can give us that complete motion in the end. The first type of motion is the linear motion. So that means along the lines, it goes straight and doesn't move anywhere from that line. The second type of basic motion is circular motion. So it has like circular uh, trajectory and it follows that circular trajectory. There are other types of motion, but in general, those types of motions can be achieved by combining linear and circular motion. Other types of motion are usually just certain combination of linear and circular motion. The first type of motion that we are going to cover is a linear motion because it's the simplest one. We will cover a uniform linear motion. What kind of motion is that? As I said, linear motion, it follows certain line. It follows straight trajectory. What does it mean that it is a uniform? That means that it doesn't change its velocity. Velocity is constant so it has the same speed at any given moment here you can see a small picture uh, from our simulations here you can see the car that's moving along the straight road so we can say that that is linear trajectory we said that it is a uniform which means that it has constant velocity and that velocity in our case is 100 that means that at any given time it will have the same velocity because it will travel for 17 seconds that means that it will cover the distance of 1,700 meters, which is displacement, as we call it in physics. If I submit these values, then you can see how this car moves, and we can wait for simulation to, to be finished. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, this is a simulation uh, that I made and that we will see in the workshop later and that you will be able to make by yourself. So that's what we are going to do in the workshop. Okay, as you can see, in the end, it covered the distance of 1,700 meters. As we said, physical quantities that describe this are velocity, displacement, and time. Displacement is the unit for displacement or distance is meter and for time it's second and what we saw before is when we studied about fundamental quantities we said that length and time are fundamental quantities so in our case we combined these two we combined them to get a new unit so this is not we got velocity or speed we can say that velocity or speed is not fundamental unit unit it's kind of derived unit so it's derived from these two we can also say that velocity is a vector it's not scalar because velocity is directed towards somewhere so it is directed towards that straight line that it follows so it has the direction of that straight line where this motion linear motion happens and the way to to calculate velocity is uh, we divide displacement and time, so that's just simple algebra, it's elementary school math, and the unit is meter per second, and when we express units in physics, I forgot to say that, to mention that, we use this kind of angular braces, and also this is just simple algebra, if we want to calculate a displacement, you need to multiply velocity by time, and in that case, second from time and second from meters per second will cancel out, and uh, we will get that unit meter. And for time, we need to multiply displacement and velocity, and we will get second when uh, meters cancel out. You can check those simulations by yourself if you want, but I recommend that we stick with this uh, until the workshop, and then we can all try them together. So the next thing that we need to talk about is classical velocity addition. What is classical velocity addition? So that means like when we have two velocities and we need to add them together. But why do we need to add them together? The reason for that is because motion is relative. Why do we say that motion is relative? Because it depends from the point of view, or as we call it, frame of reference. It depends whether you will, in what way you will observe that motion. So as you can see in this small picture on the right side, we can see a small boat that sails down the river. If you are on the coast, then you will observe the speed of that boat, the velocity of that boat, as the speed of boat plus speed of river, right? Velocity of the boat and the velocity of the river. But if you are in that boat, the way you will observe that velocity is a little bit different because frame of reference for you is different in this case. What do we need to do in this case? Depending where we stand and what's happening, we need to know how to add those velocities. There are two situations. So if bodies move in the same direction, we have big R, so that's resulting velocity, and it will be velocity of the first body plus velocity of the second body. In our case, that is uh, boat and river. So if boat sails downstream, the resulting velocity will be sum of those two velocities. So when we combine them together, so if velocity of the boat is 10 and velocity of the river is 2, the resulting velocity will be 12. But if bodies move in the opposite direction, that means that boat sails upstream. In that case, then boat will move slower because the river will take him downstream. So he needs to have higher velocity than river if he wants to arrive to desired location. In our case, if velocity of the boat is 10 and the velocity of the river is 2, but the boat goes upstream, the resulting velocity should be 8 and not 12. So we can check that in the simulation and you can also try it if you want. So let's go to classical mechanics, kinematics, and yeah, classical velocity addition. So yeah, this is our first example. So you can see that it's checked to downstream. The resulting velocity is 12. So let's try to change that. And let's say that river's velocity is 5 and we submit, we will get that the resulting velocity will be 15. But let's check the case, first case, but when the bo boat is sailing upstream. And yeah, you can see that in this case, the resulting velocity is 8. Just for the sake of showing that this simulation works, let's go back to downstream and enter some higher values. Let's say 20, and this is 10, and it goes downstream. So yeah, I hope that you can let's say 100 okay so yeah you can see that the boat sails faster 
much faster than before. And yeah, the, the important thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning of this uh, of this event is that uh, as we progress through the series, uh, we will be focused less and less on physics, and we will be uh, more and more focused on applications of physics in computer graphics and VR. The reason why we need to focus on physics right now is because we just need to cover those fundamental concepts and those fundamental principles that we will later apply in practice. Okay. So the next type of motion that we need to cover is uniformly accelerated linear motion. So basically the name suggests and the name already says what type of motion is that. Linear motion, as you said, it's along the straight line. So it follows that line, but it's not uniform linear motion. So it's uniformly accelerated. What does that mean? That means that it changes acceleration uniformly. So it doesn't change acceleration. Acceleration changes the velocity uniformly. So for example, if we have acceleration of five meters per second, that means that every second, each second, our velocity will increase for five meters per second. Acceleration is expressed as meter per second squared. Important thing to mention about uniformly accelerated linear motion is that acceleration can be both positive and negative. That means that it can increase your velocity, but it can also decrease your velocity. As we said, both velocity and acceleration are vectors. So if acceleration is negative, that means that your velocity will decrease because we will apply that subtraction to our vector and over time, each second, our velocity will decrease equally. We have some quantities that describe this motion. We have initial velocity and final velocity. Initial velocity is velocity that we start with. In our case here, it is zero meters per second. So that means that car is not moving at the beginning and final velocity, it's the velocity that we achieve at the end. Acceleration, as we said, it's the rate at what uh, velocity changes over time, displacement and time. That's something that you already see in uniform linear motion. Let's check the simulation for this one. Okay, let's change the car. Let's start from beginning. So as you can see, car, it's standing at the beginning, initial velocity is zero meters per second. It's already calculated. That means that each second, so we have acceleration of 50 meters per second squared. That means that each second, our velocity will increase for 50 meters per second. So if it starts at zero, in first second, it will be 50, in second, it will be 100, then uh, 150, 200, and so on. Let's continue with our simulation and see what happens. You can notice that car goes faster and faster. Okay, so that's it. At the very end, yeah, there is a minor glitch because of P5 library. It covered actually uh, additional nine meters. That's it about the linear motion. So that's the simplest type of motion that we have. So the next type of motion that we need to talk about is circular motion. Let's Let's go to that page. So what is circular motion? As the name suggests, it is motion that uh, along circular trajectory or it is along the circumference of a circle. Uniform, it means that it has constant angular rate of rotation, so constant speed, so there is no acceleration. And there are many good examples of this type of motion. So if you check your clock, hands of a clock, so second, hour, and minute, they have like uniform circular motion because can for seconds it needs exactly 60 seconds to make one full circle for our hand it needs one hour to complete the circle and uh sorry for a minute it needs 60 minutes to complete the circle and for hour it needs 24 12 hours to complete the circle on this clock you can try to maybe in chat maybe you can give me some other examples of circular of uniform circular motion that you know so if you have any ideas, feel free to share in chat what types of uniform circular motion you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 a good example. But about car tire, if it has so car tire, in case that that car has like uniform linear motion, then uh, it has no acceleration and also tires will spin at the same rate. But if it is accelerated, then we will not have a uniform circular motion with car tires. And also because most of people here are from computer science or some related fields, so you can imagine like fan on your CPU or GPU, 
And once it achieves certain speed, it will rotate at the same rate. So it will have uniform circular motion. But if you maybe turn on some computer game and your GPU becomes and CPU become more usage becomes much bigger, then definitely they will start to accelerate. Let's see one example, let's see one simulation, and I will describe quantities and units that are used here. Let's submit it. So as you can see here, we, we say that it has angular velocity. So it's same as velocity for linear motion, just in our case, it is called angular velocity. And that is because in our case, it goes in circles. So instead of covering the meters, it covers certain angle. In our case, angular velocity is 360 degrees. And what does that mean? That means that it covers full circle in one second. If we give it time of three seconds, that means that it will make three full circles. And if we delete this value, it will calculate it and it will say that it is 1080 degrees or three full circles. Important thing to say about angular velocity is that international standard for units says that the unit is a radian per second. And radian is another unit for angles, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but it's kind of like, if you think about the linear motion, if you think about distance, it's kind of like relationship between mile and kilometer. You just need to scale the value to get the other one. So in our calculator here, actually unit converter, you can change to radians per second. You can see that one circle, like uh, 360 degrees, has 6.28 radians. So we will talk about radians in details later. We said that those are physical quantities that describe circular motion, and those are angular velocity. We said that we can describe angle with degrees or radian. It covers same angle per time, like per seconds. The unit is radian per second, or if you're more familiar with, like degrees per second. Theta is uh, angle swept. That's kind of like distance, the displacement, the displacement that you get. You get it by multiplying angular velocity with time and time second from time and second from radian per second will cancel out and you will get radians. And for time, it's the opposite. You just divide uh, theta and omega, like angular, uh, so angle swept and angular velocity, and you will get seconds for time that is needed for that motion to happen. The next thing that we need to talk about is period and frequency. This is relatively simple and easy to explain. Probably you're familiar with it. What are period and frequencies? Period, that means like if some type of motion is repeated, it doesn't have to be circular. It can be like linear, but like uh, it goes from point A to point B and then back to A and back to B. But it has the same, it, it takes same time to repeat that motion. So that is period. Period is like the time that is needed to complete the full motion. So full circle or full distance to come to that beginning spot. Usually when we talk about period and frequency, we are usually describing it with circular motion. And probably the, the example that most people are familiar with is, let's say, our planet Earth. It has certain period of rotation, right? So it takes one full day to make full rotations. In exactly 24 hours, you will be at the same place as you were right now. That's like one period. It is also expressed in seconds because a second is basic unit for time. We use hours or some other units for time if we want to, if we get really big number with seconds. So just for sake of human beings and making it easier for us to calculate it, we use other units that we derive express time. But the interesting thing is frequency. Frequency is kind of like, not the opposite, but like reverse quantity of period. Frequency is like one over T. So that means how frequently, how many times something happens in one second. Sometimes one period can happen multiple times in one second. So something can happen more times. That's the frequency like, yeah, we can say that frequency is how often something happens in, how often something happens in a unit of time. Yeah, as you said, like CPU frequency. So for example, if let's say like fan has like five rotations in one second, we can say that fan has frequency of five Hertz. As you said, CPU frequency, so unit is Hertz and Hertz is nothing special. It's just one over second or second to the power of minus one. It's a unit that you will probably see very often as computer scientist or as a software engineer. That means like how many operations like CPU can do in a unit of time and unit of time is second, as we said. We said that period for one full rotation is half a second. That means that frequency is two. That means that it will make two full rotations in one second, right? 
And that means that angular velocity is 720 degrees because it will make two full circles in one second. So yeah, here you can see like frequency and you can see the time. So let's change these values and say that period is one. So if period is one, then frequency will also be one. That means that it makes like only one rotation per, per second. But as we decrease, uh, or let's say, let's increase the period. So the bigger, oops, sorry, there is some mistake here in the simulation. So if we decrease the period, frequency gets bigger. So in the beginning, like we have half a second period, so it will cover two full circles in one second. Check one more example. So let's say like 0 0.2. So that means that it will make five full circles in one second. So we can see that frequency is five. And let's go even beyond that. So let's go like 0 0.1 and submit and yeah. It makes 10 full circles in one second. It's very easy for calculation. So angular velocity is 3,600 degrees. So 10 full circles. Frequency is uh, like inversely proportional to period. And the way that uh, we can calculate things. So to calculate period, we can say that it is equal to 2 pi over omega or angular velocity. Algebraically, we can transform it and uh, calculate omega if we have period. So it is 2 pi over period. In our case, as long as you have like frequency, period, or angular velocity, you can calculate other two values, regardless of which one is given. As long as you have one given, you can calculate the other two. But the important thing to mention is that it needs to be uniform circular motion. This is the final type of motion for today, and it is called uniformly accelerated circular motion. You can think about it analogous way to uniformly linear, accelerated linear motion, just that it happens along the circumference of a circle. We can say that it's standing in one place in the beginning, that it goes faster and faster, so it increases its angular velocity each second. It achieves some final velocity at the end, depending on how long we want to observe that motion. So as it says, it has constant angular acceleration, but it doesn't have constant velocity. It doesn't have constant speed because it's changing every second. And also, as we said, for a uniform accelerated linear motion, this acceleration can be depending on, on the sign. So it can be positive and negative. And if it is negative, it will decrease our velocity. So if uh, let's say that our fan is spinning really really fast we played some computer game uh, our gpu was really overheated and uh, our fans were spinning really fast and then we finished our gaming session and we turned off the computer and then fans will start to accelerate but in a negative di direction which means that velocity will decrease until it finally stops and until velocity reaches zero let's check the example for this one as you can see here initial velocity is zero final is 300 it moves for 10 seconds that means that our angular acceleration is 30 so it increases by 30 it increases angular velocity by 30 each second the angle that it is swept in the end that is covered in the end is 1500 degrees but as for uh, like you saw in previous simulations you can use unit converter and transform it to radians per second which is, yeah, as I said, standard unit, but it's not something that people are used to in everyday life. Just another important thing to mention at the end is that these are physical quantities that describe uniformly accelerated circular motion, and those are like initial angular velocity, and it corresponds to initial velocity for uniformly accelerated linear motion. So all these quantities can be analogous to those quantities for linear motion. Final angular velocity corresponds to final velocity. Angular acceleration corresponds to regular acceleration. Angle swept corresponds to displacement, the distance that was covered. And time is the same. Time is always the same. And these are some formulas that you can use to calculate. So final velocity, angle swept, and also another way to approach to calculate angular velocity. So it depends on uh, things that were given to you. It depends which of these formulas you're going to use. That's it about the webinar part. We will have workshop after this. So we will have a five minute short break. Third break is over. And are you ready for the next part for the workshop? I just want to explain what are we going to do in this part. So in this part, Part, we are going to see these simulations that were presented uh, that describe uh, these types of motions that we saw before. There are six of them and uh, I will show you how they work and later I will show you how to implement them in code. 
So I guess that's the essential part of this workshop. And that's the reason why you came here today, because you want to see how physics translates into code. Before we start, you can see that this is like a website that I made. So it's called Introduction to Physics. You can access uh, this website. How to access this simulation. So you go to classical mechanics. That is the topic that we are covering today. Specific, More specifically, we are talking about kinematics. In this kinematics part, you can see these six simulations. And we will go through them one by one, see how they work, what you can do there later, how to implement. Uh, I will show you how one was implemented and the other five will be given as homework for you. You can try to do one of them or you can try to do all of them you can just try to solve specific problems or you can try to solve all of them uh in each simulation it's completely up to you you can present those solutions here and we can discuss them later or you can ask for help and if you got stuck in solving those problems we can solve them together okay firstly let's let's check what is the first simulation uh as we talked before we've covered uniform linear motion first so that's the most simple type of motion but you can see the link here in ppt to access the website that does the same website more specifically i will share the link for specific simulation okay so let's take a look at this and the thing that i uh, forgot to mention before is what is material point or physical bodies uh when we talked about experiments we try to make ideal conditions and isolated experience that we can eliminate those foreign influence so that we can focus only on one specific physical phenomena. In our case, that is called like, so if we want to make like matter, like to make it like perfect for our experiments, so we call it material point or physical body. In our case, so it will be like some kind of ball. So it will represent a material point or physical body. Before I showed you a car because uh, it is something that people are familiar with. But in our case, we will, in this case we will work with a uh, physical point with physical body and we will have this circle or a ball that represents it as we talked about uniform linear motion we have velocity displacement and time and when we submit those values it behaves it animates that motion and it shows that type of behavior but the other good thing about these simulations is that you can use them as a calculator so for example, if I delete displacement and I change time for, let's say, 10 seconds, it should give displacement of 1000 meters. Also, you can delete velocity and change time and say five seconds, and then velocity will be 200 meters per second. Basically, you can use it as a calculator for problems for this type of motion, and we will try to solve a few of them. Also, you can use it as unit converters. Let's go back to basic units i mean to the uh, to initial values meters per second are default values because those are by international standard but you can convert to kilometers per hour you can convert to miles per hour you can convert to feet per second or to knots if you are a sailor that's basically it about this unit converter now i will also teach you how to implement this unit converter Another interesting thing about this is that it shows you like function graph that describes this type of motion. There are two types of graph for this specific simulation. So you can check how displacement changes over time. And yeah, you can observe that it is linear, right? So it equally changes. It covers the same distance each second. But also there is another type of graph and that is how speed changes. It doesn't change so it is always 100 actually velocity it's always 100 meters per second i will also teach you how to implement these graphs that that describe this type of motion okay let's try to do some examples oh yeah another thing that i forgot to mention is that uh, you can use this website for other things so here are instructions how you can use these simulations if you forget for any reason then you have some short theory review you can check in case that you forget something and formula review, so you can check formulas here that you need to calculate these things. And the thing is that these simulations use these three formulas. So actually this simulation uses these three formulas to calculate values. So it goes back to default values. Those three formulas are used to calculate values. Also, I will teach you how to implement that in code, but the tricky part is that you need to cover edge cases, like if uh, time is negative, which is impossible, or uh, maybe displacement like uh, negative distance, which is also in kind of possible we will talk about that a little bit later and yeah here you have practice exercises that we will try to solve and also you can see them in ppt those are the same five 
problems that you are going to solve. So maybe we can try to solve one or two and others you can try to solve by yourself. So the first problem says, what is the velocity of an athlete that runs uniformly and covers 320 meters in 10 seconds? Yeah, as I said, we can use this as calculator and we can say that uh, we don't know velocity. So we know that it's 320 meters and how long did it say? It's at 10 seconds. We can change it to 10 seconds and it will use this formula for velocity to calculate it. So uh, it will be 320 divided by 10. So it should be 32. And as you see, it is. Okay. So if you are a student uh, and you're, you have some physics homework, this can help you to do your homework faster. Okay. So the next example is velocity of the train is 20 meters per second. How long does it take for the train? to cover the distance of 36 kilometers. Okay, so here is the tricky part. So uh, we need to work in same units. So speed is, velocity is given in meters per second, but the distance is given in kilometers. So that means that we need to convert kilometers to meters. And probably all of you know that that's 3,600 meters, but um, we can use this unit converter to do that. So we say velocity of the train is 20 meters per second. Okay, so um, let's delete this, this, and uh, kilometers per hour. Okay, sorry, reverse, uh, my, my bad. So yeah, uh, oops, let's go back to default values. Um, my bad. So yeah, 20 meters and uh, no, no, 20 meters per second. Mm -hmm. And what did we say? Uh, 36 kilometers, that's 3,600 meters. Wait, what's wrong? Why is it wrong? Uh -huh, okay. Wait, why is it not writing? Mm -hmm. Just a moment. 3,600. Okay. I have some minor issue. I don't know what's going on. So it is, we said, I don't know why I can't write. What about you guys? Can you write in these simulations? <laughs> Something happened. Is it my keyboard? Hmm. This is strange. It wants to delete, but it doesn't want to type values. Yeah, something can happen. So um, let me try to use. Uh, okay. So what? Let's open it again. So hopefully it work. It will work now. Three thousand and six hundred. Yeah. Okay. So twenty meters per second. Uh, Three thousand and six hundred meters and. Yeah, time should be like 180 seconds. So that's a little bit uh, unclear to us people. So let's convert it to kilometers per hour. So that's kind of like 0 0.05 hours. Hmm. Okay, so that's still unclear. Mm. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 36 kilometers. Sorry, I, I missed one zero. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, so let's convert that back to, yeah, so that's 0 0.5 hours or half an hour. Okay, and yeah, there are other few other things that you can do here, and that's that you can uh, play and pause the simulation if you want to observe it in a certain moment. And you can also, in case that you're using the car, you can enable or disable the sound of the engine and increase the volume, so which is actually not that important. Um, for this for this simulation, but in case that you want it to be realistic, it's there. Okay, so um, for other three problems, you can try to implement them by yourself. But the next thing that we should talk about is how can we implement this in code. So, uh, but before we go to code, just want to say that this was implemented by using p5.js. So it's uh, it's library for JavaScript. So 
maybe some of you are not familiar with it, or if you're from University of London, you can, you're probably familiar and you know how to work with it. So, but because this is focused on physics, um, we won't uh, be bothered by that P5JS part. So we can completely eliminate it and you will only focus on physics part and the JavaScript part. So you will, you will not need to implement uh, this kind of graphics and uh, uh, any, any visual details here. So you will only try to implement the behavior. So you will implement the behavior from these formulas. So, the, so there are three things that you're going to try to implement in this workshop. And those are, you will try to implement this calculator for, uh, for formulas. So based on two values, it will calculate the third value. Or for example, if one value is given, uh, it will prompt that uh, you need to enter at least one more value so that it can uh, calculate the third value. Or in case that uh, three values are given, uh, it will check whether that combination is possible because uh, certain co only one combination should be possible for, for these values. Okay. And yeah, also you need to test those edge cases like negative time and, uh, and the negative uh, displacement. So that's the first thing. Second thing that you're going to implement is a unit converter. So uh, you'll probably have it in your calculator on your phone or computer. So how to convert from meters uh, per second to kilometers per hour. Uh, so basically this part, how to implement it. And the final part that you're going to implement is um, this um, function graph. So actually this part is not mandatory. I mean, nothing of this is mandatory, but um, maybe you will need to be familiar at least a little bit with P5 library so that you can draw this on the screen. But the thing is that uh, this uses uh, values from the per given here, and then uh, it describes the behavior um, based on those values. So yeah, those are three things that, that we need to do in this workshop. Okay, so let's go back to PPT and see those things. Okay, so the first thing that, um, that, that is given here is a unit converter. So we have a certain set of values. And so it, is, it, it will check. Uh, it's basically just a, a bunch of if else statements. So it will check uh, what is selected. Uh, in this drop down menu. So default is meters per second. And uh, for example, now we want to calculate to kilometers per hour. So it will check if kilometers per hour were selected. And in case that uh, that's what was selected, it will, it, will, um, it will use these formulas, those three formulas that I showed you uh, to convert to kilometers per hour. So you should know uh, that um, if you want to uh, convert, uh, that kilometer is like, like 1,000 times um, uh, bigger than meter. So you should divide by 1,000. Also, uh, you should know that like one hour has 3,600 seconds, so 60 per minute and 60 minutes, 60 times 60, 3,600. So it will be divided to, to get to get that number and velocity, uh, you just multiply by 3.6, which is the value that you get from these two numbers, 3,600 and 1,000. So it's just basic algebra, just in code. So what you need to do here is like, I decided to, to make it fixed to two decimal places. So we will use to fix and select two decimal places. And also it will parse float. Mm, and then that value will be assigned to uh, well. So that's just short for velocity. And that's how we call it, how I decided to call this section here. Well, and uh, this flow is for displacement in calculator and uh, TIM is for time. So just uh, to make it a little bit suggestive so that people can still know what it is. Okay. So, and for other uh, things in our calculator, it's, it's the same thing. So uh, it will check whether it is mile per hour, feet per second, knots or meters per second. So it will just, it will just uh, do the same thing. It will calculate 
uh, fix it to two decimal places and uh, change the values accordingly. So, yeah, in case just in case if it is meter per second, then it is it doesn't change anything. It will just get the velocity value, uh, put it, uh, set it to two decimal uh, points, and assign it as well value. Uh, and it will do the same for um, displacement in time. So um, that's it about this part. So in case that you want to make this by yourself, you just need to find, oops, I'm so sorry. Um, let's go back. So you just need to find these values um, online. So how much is one kilometer? How much is mile? How much is feet? How much is not? And uh, when you find those values, you can you can just implement them here in code. Okay, so any questions about this um, unit converter? Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Okay, no, so then we will go to the next part and the next part is draw functions. So it needs to draw this function that we showed. Uh, and you will need to use a little bit of p5.js and I said that I will not bother you with this one because uh, maybe you're not familiar with it, but if you want to, uh, to, um, to try to do this uh, and solve it by yourself, you will get code templates at the end of this workshop and you will have detailed instructions step by step. And if you follow those steps, you can implement it uh, by yourself. But so just I will show you how that looks in code. So here you can see uh, that it uses some functions that are already available in that library. So it uses line and triangles uh, and other lines and text. Mm -hmm. To, to draw it on the screen. And uh, you can see that it uses those values, uh, time value, uh, it uses displacement value, and it uses velocity value. So, um, so you can use those values to draw them on the screen uh, if you know P5 library. And also the important thing to uh, say is that you should also check what is selected. So does it use like, uh, uh, mm, displacement over time or it's using uh, velocity over time so it, it checks which one is selected so whether it is this one radio button or this other radio button okay and the final thing that we need to check uh, is 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 actually how to apply those values so i don't know if you can clearly see this screen but this ppt and the uh, co code templates for your kind of homework will be given to you at the end so you can read it in details and you can see that it is commented uh, in details so it will be easy for you to understand and actually this is the part that you uh, came for today and yeah so uh, what is this part so this part is actually the calculator that we saw so based on uh, given values it calculates um, it calculates um, uh, the remaining value, so the only one that is not given. So and say let's that's one thousand, and it will say that it requires fifty seconds to to come to this one. So basically, how to implement this in code is we need to check these formulas, and we need to to do calculations and do those edge cases. So I don't know if if you can see um, if you can see if it is clear on your screen, but uh those uh those are like just a bunch of if statements uh to check all all cases that can happen so uh if um so first is like if a user hasn't entered any values any numeric value and it will say it will display like prompt to show the message alert you entered a non-numeric value sorry that's a, if, if if it is not a numeric value if you enter a letter or you enter something else okay um the next if statement is if you if you entered no values so just like nothing then it will give you an alert message you must enter uh, at least two values so that the third value can be calculated so and then goes on and on and it, it checks all cases 
uh, and it gives you a appropriate calculation or if your uh, values are not correct because of some reason it will alert you and tell you how to fix that mistake so that is the way how to implement this in code and that's it about the coding part so any questions about this So, any questions? Okay, I guess not. So, then that's it about this. And let's go to classical velocity edition. So, as I said, um, as I said, uh, we will cover these problems now. Uh, but, um, yeah. So we covered uniform linear motion, and uh, I showed you how those three things are implemented in code. So how to implement unit converter, how to draw functions, and how to implement calculator for values based on equations. So uh, that's explained for this, uh, this uh, simulation uniform linear motion, but I will give you templates for the other five uh, that you can try to implement by yourself, and then you can present your solutions uh, tomorrow or when we have uh, another episode of our series. So, yeah, there you will find those detailed instructions how to how to do it step by step. And the rest of code is obfuscated because you don't need to be bothered by other part that is a P5.js library. Okay, so let's go to classical velocity addition. So can you can you see the simulation? Okay, excellent. And yeah, so let's try to solve some problems. So it says speed of boat uh, relative to the water is two meters per second, and speed of the river is one point five meters per second. What is the speed of boat relative to shore if it's sailing downstream? So speed of boat two and river one point five. So let's try boat. Two, uh, river 1.5 and resulting velocity should be 3.5 and yeah we can see that here and here you, on, on function graph you can see uh, those three velocities uh, you can see that they are constant they don't change over time okay the next example says that speed of boat relative to water is 4 meters per second and speed of river is 1.5 so what is the speed of boat relative to shore if it is sailing upstream so actually now it should slow down the boat so 4 and 1.5 so this is 4 so because of that classical velocity addition so now we should uh, do subtraction of vectors so we have two vectors boat's velocity and river's velocity and we should do subtraction and we will get 2.5 oops oops yeah i didn't select upstream so that's my mistake so if it is downstream, it is 5.5. So we should switch it to upstream and we will get 2.5. Okay, I'm not sure if any of you can share the screen so that we make it more interactive on this platform so that each one of you can try to do these simulations. Uh, so maybe next time we will do this on another platform so that each one of you can try and uh, do these simulations and present to other attendees that would be much better but for today we are limited with this platform and only i will i will show these simulations if anyone um, wants to share their screen uh we can turn your presenter mode on then you can share your screen oh, if is, you it want. is it possible i think so okay so if if anyone wants you can try to do any of these simulations because yeah this should be a workshop but so it would be the best yep. if any of you can try to do some of these simulations mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, so one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, we're gonna have like after the event ended, um, both events uh, and the, the same thing that repeated. We will send out um, well a few things the the links that we we said, but most important of all is uh, we will invite you to our Discord server, and there will be a dedicated channel for you to so you don't have to like you can showcase discuss things with us with Nicola, um, with other people in the joining event, and it will, that channel will be like for the series. So. You'll get things uh, basically you showcase your work in that channel as well so yep something i forgot to mention before hopefully that's helpful for people and if you want to again if you want to share a screen you can let us know in the chat also, and then anyone yeah. that wants to share the screen 
Okay, so if no one wants, then I will try to do a uh, few more simulations. So you can, you, uh, yes, sounds awesome. Don't think we can join presenter mode though. Mm, yeah, that's, so should I stop sharing so that he can share? How does it work here? Okay, so um, Rico, could you, do, do you have the option to share screen now? Wait, I will I stop just sharing turn... so that he can share. Oh yeah, because I yeah I turn it on, um, so you're supposed to be able to share. Let's see. Come on. Oh yes, we see something popping on <coughs> on a screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, apparently, like sharing your screen is a separate thing from like being able to turn on your audio and video. So. I don't know if it's a good thing or not, <laughs> it's a bad thing, but yeah. Let's see. So Rico, is share screen available for you? I, I wasn't I sharing my screen? Uh, no. I, oh, I, uh, I thought I was. <laughs> oh, OK, I no, we didn't see it. No, we, can, we can't see it. <laughs> okay, I'll try again then. Okay. Mm OK, there we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Excellent. Nice. Great. So yeah, Rico, you, you, you can choose simulation of your choice, and you can try to solve some of those problems by yourself. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, just uh, for sake of the audience, so can you read the problem? For, um, so read one of those problems. Okay, cool. Uh, for the first one, find acceleration of a cyclist whose speed rises from 18 kilometers an hour to 25 kilometers an hour in five seconds. Mm -hmm. So the initial velocity would be, uh, if we switch to 18 kilometer, uh, two kilometers per hour, then it'll be 18 kilometers an hour. Final mm -hmm. velocity would be 25 kilometers per hour. And then mm -hmm. it is five seconds. Uh, five seconds, which would be time, I believe. And then I can just leave displacement and acceleration out. Mm -hmm. And then it should just calculate. Oops. Uh, oh, actually, it doesn't work backwards. Oh. Sorry. It doesn't work backwards, the calculator. It was not enabled. So yeah, you can try some other values in uh, meters per second. So you can try any values that you like. Sorry about that. In the first, in the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll just make it the same then. Um, submit. Okay, very, very slow start. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there we go. Yeah. So, so if you want to change values, just uh, do it one more time in the unit calculator. Mm. Uh, come again? Uh, yeah, yeah, so kilometers per hour. So if you want to show it uh, in kilometers per hour, you need to do it one more time, actually. S submit again, or what? Uh, yeah, I think it's just a moment. Because now it's just meters per second. Yeah, it's meters per second. So if you want to show it, go to meters per second and then backwards uh, to kilometers per hour. Like so? Yep, and now to kilometers per hour, and it will show you values in kilometers per hour. Uh... Yeah. yeah. It so it's not that refined yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So now it's yeah. So it's actually sixty-four. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Okay. Cool. So if I go okay. eighteen, uh, Yeah, it doesn't work backwards, unfortunately. If you enter uh, it there, it will not. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. So oh. that's the problem. So yeah. yeah. And what about circular motion? Maybe you want to do some period of frequency or circular motion or something else. Cool. Or accelerated motion. Mm -hmm. uh, problem two, angular velocity of the body is 720 degrees per second. 
-hmm. How long does it take for that body to sweep out an angle of 3,600 degrees? So velocity of 720 per second, which I believe is the yeah. uh, like default. Mm -hmm. What was it? Um, how long does it take for the body to sweep at an angle of 3,600? So then it's just simply 3,600. We leave time out, and then that'll be five seconds. Yeah, and maybe you can try to enter um, some other time to check if it will prompt that it's yeah, possible. Yeah, so if I say nine, values. and I say submit, then I get a impossible value submission. Yeah, exactly. OK. Yeah, yeah uh, cool. Any other problems that you want to try? Anything else? <laughs> I don't want to yeah. okay. hold up the, the, yeah, the course, okay. the webinar. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. So yeah, you will have access to that link, so you can play as much as you want. So mm, it will be available nice. to attend this. And yeah, so you can try to improve that graph if you want to make it scale with values, because now it shows, I guess you can see up to uh, 500 uh, uh, radians and uh, also five seconds. But you can, uh, if you know P five JS, you can. Uh, make it to scale with values that are entered and show bigger values on the graph. So because mm. in certain situations when uh, motion happens for a longer period of time, uh, it will just go out, go out of bounds and it will not show it uh, on the graph anymore. So, okay. So basically cool. that's it. Mm. Anyone else that want to try? I just turn on presenter mode for everyone. So if you want to try, you ah, can yeah. actually just. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rico, again uh, for okay, doing that. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, and uh, another thing that I forgot to show you about this, uh, just a moment. Can you can you see my screen now? Not yet. Oh yes. Okay. So you yep. can see it. Okay. So in case that English is not your native language, uh, which is my case, so uh, you have this language picker here. So you can change it okay, to Serbian, which is my native. You can change it to Chinese, to Russian. And uh, yeah, that was Serbian Cyrillic. This is Russian. Yeah, so yeah, mm, basically those three languages uh, are uh, kind of used uh, worldwide. So English, Chinese, and Russian. And Serbian, I guess, that nobody from Serbia besides me is here today. So yeah, you can also change the language and everything should be available um, in that language. So yeah. Okay, so let's go back to English. Yeah, so that's it. So we covered classical velocity addition. We solved some problems. Mm, yeah, we did uh, uniform accelerated linear motion. Yeah, so I think we covered all of those. Mm, oops, sorry. Mm, yeah, so we just haven't seen any problem for a uniformly accelerated circular motion. So just for sake of doing it, I will show that one as well. Mm, yep, so here we have one. So it says that the wheel starts rotating with angular acceleration of 0 0.5 radians per second. Uh, what angular velocity will it have after 10 seconds and what uh, angle will it sweep out? So it starts rotating. That means that uh, initial velocity is zero, right? Uh, acceleration 0 0.5, um, radians okay, 0 0.5. Uh, and what else do we know? 10 seconds, right? So time is 10. We need to calculate angle swept and final velocity and yeah. Angle will be 25 radians, and we can convert that to uh, degrees. So, yeah. angle set degrees. Why it doesn't work? Um, is it some mistake? I don't think so. Okay. So, um, angular velocity. Okay, wait. I, I, I think I made a mistake with this one. So we'll st let's try another problem. We'll start rotating, and after 20 seconds, it has angular velocity of 2 radians per second. So 20 seconds. Mm, OK. It has 2 radians, 0. It has 2. And it asks us to calculate angular acceleration and angle swept. OK. 
Yeah, and it should change the values, but I'm not sure if it is calculating this correctly. Um, I will check that and let you know. I will update you uh, on that on uh, on Discord channel. Okay, so that's it about this presentation for today. So is there anything that you want to ask me? So does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. I guess that's it. So Cynthia, can you share the link for that, let's call it homework? So for mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, as I said, for these five simulations, so you will get the code and uh, you can also use the link to access the working simulations. So for those templates, you need to change the code. Uh, when you open the code, uh, you will find instructions step by step. You will need to change three functions and th th those will be like three separate files. So those three files will be, um, uh, just a moment, where is it? Uh, yeah, so the first one is called the unit converter. So you will find the file uh, unitconverter.js. Next one is draw function, draw function JS and apply values uh, JS. So in those files, you will find no code, but just instructions step by step that you need to follow if you want to uh, uh, create this by yourself. So if you if you complete this correctly, then you should uh, have working uh, working uh, simulations that you can uh, that you saw here, and you still have access to those. Uh, that's the link that's pinned uh, at the top of this chat. So as, as you go, you can compare your work and uh, compare it how it behaves to uh, how it behaves compared to those simulations that you saw today. So if you if you manage to do something, you can present it tomorrow or when we have the next episode of this event. So yeah, and I forgot to say one thing. So you will in that uh, uh, in that uh, template folder, you will find five folders. Each folder is uh, for each simulation individually and uh, they can be uh, run as uh, separate uh, simulations so they will not be part of this uh, website so it should look something like this just a moment and i will show you give me a second so it should look something like this so it will be just simulation without anything else. And uh, the only thing that you need to run this is put that folder in your Visual Studio code or any other IDE that you use. And the only thing that you need to launch this is uh, use a live server extension so that you can run it in your browser. So I think that's all that you need to know uh, in order to complete this uh, sort of assignment. Okay. Mm -hmm. 